Welcome to the Pregnancy Loss Podcast, the place I created for moms like us. Pregnancy loss is all-encompassing and creates an overarching theme that runs through our lives forever. We have to learn to live with and beside the grief of losing our baby. We have to learn how to live again, how to parent again, how to engage and interact and be social again, how to communicate effectively to connect with our spouses and significant others. We have to find who we are now. I'm here to empower and inspire you to live a life even with our unique circumstances. We cannot change what happened, but we can grow and use that strength and resilience to create a life that we love. I'm here to share everything I know about grief, motherhood, loss, marriage, friendship, and parenting. I'm here to encourage you to find the beautiful side of grief, the side where we don't have to isolate ourselves or suppress the need to share stories, the side where you have moms just like you to support and encourage you. The side where we become the best versions of ourselves, not in spite of our loss, but thanks to it. Pregnancy loss is devastating, but it can also be an opportunity to reflect on who we were and who we want to become. So join me every Tuesday for a new episode on the Pregnancy Loss Podcast. Let's jump in. Hi, Gina. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, Welcome to the Pregnancy Loss and Motherhood Podcast. Gina is our guest today and I'm so excited. We have been trying to connect for a while and then my family got sick like everybody knows. I saw everybody what's going on in my life here but um, yeah if you want to introduce yourself let us know who you are what you do. Oh absolutely and Valen thank you for having me today. Very excited. I really enjoyed our pre-show conversations and uh, very excited to talk to you today. So just so your audience knows, I'm a mom of three. I have a 19-year-old daughter, a 15-year-old daughter, and then my little man is nine. And I live in Michigan, and I have been married 21 years. I have also been an attorney specializing in childbirth cases for 21 years. And just so your audience understands what a childbirth case is, Um, these are cases involving the birth of a baby when something goes wrong and baby's not born healthy. Um, Sometimes baby may pass or mom may pass away during childbirth. As the attorney, I come in and I find out what happened, what went wrong, why, and most important question, what should have been done so baby was born healthy or mom around to raise you know, her baby. So listen, I'm not a medical professional at all. I've been starting to say that on podcasts. I am kind of jealous of the medical professionals because the ones who deliver babies, because they get to see the good, you know, some bad, they get to see the good, you know, as the lawyer looking at the bad and literally they take years analyzing these mistakes, analyze. So I've done that, see, 21 years, but I was 19 years deep into the field. Um, My niece was pregnant with the first baby of our next generation and she had a pretty rough, going to make it or not. So that event stopped me and took me out of my legal head. Uh, And basically, so that day when my niece went into labor, I was 1,100 miles from her that day. And I started to think of my kids. And, you know, what if I was 1,100 miles from them when they went to go give birth to my grandkids? Because I'll tell you how I would prepare my family for childbirth is completely different than how another family would prepare for childbirth because of what I have seen over these years. So I started to basically write down everything that I was seeing in these cases that we can learn from. There's, you know, chapter one are the lessons from the baby case. It's a lesson. We're learning from the past to prevent it from happening in the future. So I just created this book, which started for my kids. Um, so I could have healthy grandkids. And as I started to write the book, I'm like, wait a minute, this is this is information that families really a, a across the world could use to help them have a healthy baby. So June 2023, I published my book. And now I'm hanging out with you on a Sunday. <laughs> it's amazing. Like I, as I like, I have her book. <laughs> um, like even I haven't finished it yet, but just going through the table of contents, I'm like, I've had five children and I still don't know half of this information. Yeah. Like, and that's insane. Okay. Like I know I've, I, f- I feel like I heard you talking about like, you know, we always prepare for the birth plan and, you know, we all these like seemingly, I mean, they're not not important. But they're least less important than knowing 
like how to make sure your doctors are good, like yeah. being comfortable with your doctors, um, picking a good hospital, all these things, like where you're going to give birth to your baby and where all the the seemingly bad things can happen. Like we don't talk about that. And it, it drives me crazy. Like as a pregnancy loss educator, like nobody tells you your baby can die when you're pregnant. Like there's that, that, you know, they don't want to scare you. I get that. But having like all the information, like even if it's a pamphlet. So, you know, if they're going through their file or their folder and they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know this was, you know, a possibility. But we don't have that. And I feel like this book gives that, um, but not in a scary way. I feel like it's scary because you're also a mom. So it's very... Um, like I'm able to read it and it's very easy read. Like I can, and I can understand it, um, which is great because a lot of, you don't use like all the doctor jargon and like words that we don't understand um, and things. Uh, so I really appreciate that part of it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm, what is, uh, I don't know. What was your favorite part about this? Like as oh. a, childbirth attorney like i love that question you know what i've been on so many shows i get all these questions but you know what no one's asked me my favorite part of the book so mm. i think the favorite part of the book and this is really what makes the book stand out especially against you know well the whole book is very different than an ordinary you know yeah. pregnancy book by far this is not something you're gonna you know, read anywhere else. Um, but no, I think one chapter that I spent a lot of time on, like an insane amount of time probably, is chapter 11. And these are the common facts and the common issues in the legal baby cases. So listen, while I may identify these problems, I tell you basically what you need to know or do to make sure that these mistakes or complications don't happen during the birth of your baby. So, because my book is definitely about, or back up, my book is not about what can go wrong, but making sure that it does, you know, in fact, go right. Yeah. I spent a lot of time going back through the cases and just, you know, going back through and make, okay, what is standing out? What is not? I mean, I, there's a couple of basic ones in there that I've known since like I started in this field 21 years ago. Um, for instance, Pitocin. Pitocin is the drug in, used to induce mom's labor. That is in most of my baby cases. So yep. that's an important, like if you're pregnant or you're considering an induction, personally, I think if you're pregnant, um, you need to understand what that drug is. Yep. And because, you know, the introduction to the book, when we talk about my niece's story, she was 38 weeks. She wasn't in labor. And she went to the hospital per my instruction because I'm like, I want to get baby checked out. I want okay. you to go to the hospital. I want the fetal monitor on the baby. Call me back. And they did. And the baby was not doing well. So she wasn't in labor. So she had two options, C-section or Pitocin induction. She okay. chose Pitocin induction. And it is the introduction to the book because ultimately it's the birth that you know, again, let you stopped hear. me in my tracks and made me realize that some of the stuff that's in my brain needs to, needs to come out. I'm so thankful that you, it was, you know, that you needed to do that after this. Um, I remember my first child, I was, uh, Callie, I was 40, almost 41 weeks. My first mm -hmm. baby. Like now looking back, I could be like, yeah, I wasn't ready yet. <laughs> like she would have mm -hmm. come. Like my body's not going to kick her out when it's time. But I, I, you know, listening to the doctors, they don't really want you going past like that 42 week mark, you know, so I would have been fine, but I didn't know how to advocate for myself. My husband didn't know how to advocate for me because we didn't, we, we were always taught to listen to your doctors. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. You don't question them. You know, they're, it's like, they're, it's unfair, but they are on a pedestal and they are, you know, above us in our society. Like when we go to a doctor, we're there because they know more than us and because they, they can see what we can't and those types of things. But I ended up getting induced with my child and it didn't take. 
And so I was there. Um, they started the Pitocin. Nothing was happening. And it, it had been like 12 hours. I'm like, I'm starving. And so they let me eat. And we oh. had to do it again. And then it wasn't working. So they had to do like Cervidil, you know. So here comes the all the, oh, um, okay. inve- not the inventions, um, the interventions after that. So Cervidil and then scraping my membranes and then all these things mm-hmm. to start it when clearly my body was not ready. Um, right. And just, you know, so and then my second one, I was induced as well. Um, wow. And there was no reason for it. I'm like, I've been thinking about it and I'm like, why did, you know, they couldn't get me in. So when they could like, cause they were so busy. So when they did have an opening, you know, and I was at that 40 week mark, they're like, okay, let's go. We'll do an induction. Like this was in Virginia. My first birth was in Michigan. Um, and you know, so another induction, this one took better than the first, um, but then I also had an epidural and they were giving me, I, I think fentanyl. Um, oh, wow. obviously I said I wanted it, you know, yeah. um, and then with Evelyn, um, she had died like when my labor started. So oh. this was the first time that my body had started labor on its own. Um, and where am I going with this? My brain just quits. And then my fourth child, I had a completely unmedicated birth in a birth center with my doula, mm-hmm. um, the same doula who was with me with my loss, for my loss. Um, and then my fifth, I ended up, like, I was, I had contractions, but they weren't, like, super strong. Um, but I was earlier this time. I'm trying to think. It's just weird, all the interventions that happen. Um, so my last mm-hmm. one things were, I had to get induced because my, um, fluid, my fluid was super low. Like, uh, uh, the day before it was like at an eight centimeters or something. And that's like borderline of, uh, too low. Um, and then the next day it was like at a two. Um, so they're like, okay, we kind of got to get you in. I think those are the right numbers. I could be wrong. I'm not. (laughs) not great at that they part. sounds right i mean that's okay. about right um, and she's like okay well because of my loss my loss and everything else you know yeah. i'm going further and could result in another stillbirth like so we're like okay let's do it went and got induced um and those were all fine but then his heart rate dropped and they were like flipping me over like doing all these things and i had no idea what was going on like so mm-hmm. understanding like we'll definitely talk about Pitocin and then all the interventions that happen afterwards because all of these things again, like this is my first fifth baby now, and I didn't understand what was going on. And I was scared yeah. because nobody was telling me what was going on. I could tell the heart rate was dropping. You know, you can hear the thing, you can see it. Yeah. But why? Like what's going on? Um and then when he was born, you know, he had, um, his cord was wrapped tightly around his neck, yeah. like, and he didn't cry right away. And like, it was really scary for a time, but he was fine. Um, but yeah, I feel like we need more education on what happens in the hospital, what can happen, what happens when you decide to get Pitocin or what happens when you decide to get an epidural? My second epidural, the anesthesiologist had to try 11 times before he got it. 11 times. And at the time, I mean, I'm in labor. Like, I don't, I, I'm not really in control of anything. I can't think straight, you know? And all I'm yeah. noticing is like all this pain and him doing it over and over again. And at this time, the spouse could be in the room still. So my husband's there like, what's going on? Why is this so difficult? Like, um, Was it a doctor in training? It was an anesthesiologist. He like just came from a um, heart, heart surgery or something. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And he just, he wasn't the nicest, you know, and you talk about like etiquette and how the doctor's, you know, acting and how you feel about them and all this stuff. But it's like, how do I advocate for myself again when I'm in labor and I can barely, you know, think straight when I'm 
trying to deal with contractions and I'm, I'm trying to do everything that I'm being told, you know, to make sure everything's okay. And, you know, especially how to, you know, maybe help our husbands. They also need to understand because, you know, when you talk about the baby advocate that we should have, like most of the time that our partners or spouses are that for us, but right. they're normally not. I mean, from what I've experienced and what I've seen from moms is like, they don't, they're not that into it. <laughs> like they yeah. don't have that much education around what's going on. Right. They follow mom's lead is what I notice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we just really need some strong support. And I mean, what are your thoughts? Do you want to go into Pitocin? Do you want to talk about baby advocates? Like there's all this stuff is so important. Yeah, we can do. I mean, you just kind of touched on the husbands, so we can always, you know, hit the baby advocate and then hit yeah. Pitocin because Pitocin is yeah. a really important conversation. But yeah, no, having your designating somebody as the baby advocate, because it is hard to think straight, think straight when you're in labor, you're focusing on delivering your baby. Um, so to have that second set of eyes on you is absolutely huge. So husbands, I mean, sometimes too, if you give them a job and they know what to do, um, or you give them a job and they will learn what to do, they're great at it. It's, it's like they just sometimes yeah. get a little bit direction. But I'll tell you, you know, my book, if your husband, the soon-to-be dad, goes through my book and he understands what's in my book, he will be the best advocate you can possibly imagine. I mean, husbands instinctively yeah. do want to protect their baby. They do want to protect their wife. Yeah. And my book will help them, you know, ha activate that intuition, activate those instincts. Um, So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he can bring baby and wife home, you know, and start their life together. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, um... <laughs> My husband, like as, as my, every pregnancy that happened, like, of course, my third one where I lost Evelyn, he couldn't be there. So it was like, after that, he, he took a more active role, um, which was great, but I don't want moms to have to go through a terrible thing, you know, before they have somebody helping them advocate. So yeah, that's amazing. Well, if you know certain things too, I mean, there's just so, you know, one of the biggest lessons from the childbirth cases is basically you got to learn about childbirth in order to make those, you know, really good decisions because the families and the cases, it's so, it's just devastating. Oftentimes they are just one decision or minutes from a healthy baby. So good decision making, you're going to make way better decisions if you understand something as opposed to, you know, not understanding something. It's very, you know, just like life. Yeah. So I love that uh, point yeah. of your book that you, you actually go through everything in labor and delivery and like what it is, what it means, what's happening, what you need to look out for. Yeah. It's very intuitive. It's so good. Um, I know. So I'm on the, how to choose the good doctor chapter. That's my, um, section I'm in right now. And I did a, um, I think I did a live or a podcast episode on how to, how to choose your OB or your midwife, you know? Um, and I definitely touched on like intuitively, like how you feel about them, how you connect with them, how you, um, how you feel. Like I know a lot of us after loss tend to, I mean, obviously go two ways. It's not stay with a provider or find another one. And initially I stayed, I stayed in the practice because it was one of the biggest in the area. And there's like eight, I think there was like eight different midwives. So, I mean, I could see different mm -hmm. ones. Um, but it, it was also one of these practices where they make you see everybody just in case when you go in labor, you've at least met with them one time. So you kind of mm -hmm. have a, you know, feeling for them in labor because you can't choose really who is going to be there on call when you have a baby it's yeah. just it's kind of impossible to know unless you're having a c-section or being induced and i had a a challenging experience with my initial midwife because she had coerced me to do what she wanted once my doula had left the room she was my only support person and i was in labor my baby was dead and um, the, oh, the, the doctor on call, he did not like, cause I asked for a C-section 
I said, I just oh, want well. this baby out. I just, I need this to be over. Like, that's what I needed. And instead of, and I'm, I'm a doula. Like, I understand. I understand the effects. I understand the side effects of a C-section, the bad things that can happen, you know, all these things. And they spent two hours trying to talk me out of it instead of starting things. So I had to sit there having these strong contractions. They did start blood work, of course, test me for drugs and all these things that totally just made me angry. But protocol, I get it. Um, but she sat, she would sit by my bedside and she's like, well, you know, he doesn't think it's the best idea for you. Um, you know, we want to make the best de decision possible, uh, the best outcome for you. Um, you know, and you know, what do you want? And I kept telling them and she just kept having the same conversation with me. And then my doula left the room because I needed ice. Like I'm sitting there, I'm starving, I'm thirsty, I'm grieving. And, you know, she's like, well, we, we really want to get this started. You know, we think that this is the best way, but what do you think? They kept asking me what I wanted, but telling me it wasn't the right thing, basically. Um, and I just felt so cornered and obviously can't think straight. Like, not only am I in labor, my baby's dead. Like, my husband's wow. on deployment. I just, wow. I'm, to this day, I'm still so angry. Like, I'm angry. I still want to be able to talk to them and just tell them what they've done because, and I mean, I get it, but I'm like, I know women who are, you know, because they kept trying to also tell me that I was too overweight for a C-section when I've seen women schedule their C-sections who are bigger than me, <laughs> more mm -hmm. unhealthy than me. And so it, nothing made sense. And I just didn't trust them anymore. So when I was pregnant again after my loss, um, I, I stayed there for 33 weeks. And then the closer I got, the scare, the scarier I got, the more scared I got. And so I switched at 34 weeks, I switched wow. to a birth center and this was a complete, you know, it was, uh, great midwives. There were, um, the midwives in training and this was COVID. So, I mean, this was September when I gave birth yeah. of 2020 wow. and it was really important for me that my kids were there because when I had Evelyn, I didn't even realize that I could bring my kids up there to see her you know, to really actually meet their sister, see that she was real, all these things that I just, you know, regret. And I didn't have the, the capacity to, you know, make decisions. So mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's my main thing. I need my kids there. My husband was there even during COVID. They're like, yeah, that's fine. So, you know, I went to labor on my own this time again, right after Evelyn, which was great. We went and had a wonderful, you know, unmedicated, very healing birth at the birth center, um, with my kids there, with my husband there. Like it was really cool. But what are, what do you think is like a few of the most important things that, that you should look at when trying to choose a doctor or an OB or a midwife? Like what's the most important thing do you think? Yeah. So real quick with Evelyn, did you get your C-section or not? Okay. So I'm going to have to comment on that because that is very, I'm trying to stay calm. So that is very frustrating. So listen, moms out there, no matter what, you are the decision maker in the labors. So when you have a team like this and they are giving you options, they are making recommendations. Your doctor, your midwife, your nurse, your residents, whoever is involved are simply giving you recommendations you make the choice. If they don't like your choice, tell them to go document it in the medical records and you've made your choice. Leave me alone. Now, I know, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, but this is like very upsetting when I hear this. But so just keep that in mind. You know, it's and then I get a lot of questions these days. Well, I don't want to upset anybody. You know, right. that's that's I, you know, a disappoint or I don't you know, like you just said, like the doctors are on pedestals right now or whatever. But listen, when we're also talking about one of the biggest days of your life, you know, bringing your baby into this world, don't worry about hurting someone's feelings. It's mm -hmm. very important. Make your decisions, follow your instincts. 
But going to and picking the good doctor or picking the good midwife is really important. So that chapter I have on picking a good doctor, that's based upon, you know, at that point, 19 years of my life analyzing OBGYNs. And I've never said this on the record. I did say it the other day when it came up during a conversation. But I've been representing, you know, when I have a case, I also represent the um, the hospital, I represent the doctors, I represent the nurses, the whole delivery team. And actually, you know what, I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't say that if I've never said it before, but I'll just say oh. it because it is what it is. But typically, like in these cases, I mean, doctors, they don't really accept that they may have done something wrong. They typically point to somebody else. So it's really important to have your good doctor because they do hedge your delivery team and your doctor, unless they're picking up a 12 hour shift is not at the hospital. So most of the time when you walk into the hospital to deliver your baby, you're really getting the people who are scheduled to work that day. And so it's important that you do have, you know, a good doctor, you know, behind you. So I go through basically when I have these cases going through, you know, the doctor analysis that I do. And then I'm like, okay, and this is like analysis you guys need to do. But just starting with these are, it's so basic, but you have to follow it. I think that when you're pregnant, at least me, I mean, my instincts and intuition were like on overdrive because I was in mama bear mode where I want to protect my baby. Not, I didn't always follow my instincts and intuition, but I wish I would have now years later. But anyway, more importantly, follow your instincts, follow your intuition, you know, just because a doctor, if somebody recommends a doctor and they're like, oh, they delivered my baby and it was an amazing experience. That does not mean anything. Listen, here, here's another thing. And I go through this in that chapter of my book that, you know, good a good reputation does not equate to good care. So keep that in mind. But also different doctors have different opinions. When I first got into this field, I was so overly confused because I would meet with one doctor. He tells me something and another doctor tells me another thing. I mean, they're, they're, doctors do not agree on anything. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. So, you know, if you pick a doctor and you're not getting that warm, fuzzy feeling, you feel like your doctor is short with you, you doctor says a couple of things and you're like, hi there, red flag, then go look at a different doctor because I'm sure there is a doctor out there that will align more with how you think that you will be more comfortable with. And that's the doctor you want, you know, on your side, one that you're super comfortable with. Especially, again, they're really managing your labor from not within the hospital. Usually that's the nurse, the midwife, they're the direct patient care. So um, having the good doctor. But listen, the other big important thing is communication skills. Your doctor really needs to have good communication skills. And I can tell you, if you don't like the way your doctor communicates with you, if his answers are really short, you feel like you're more of a, you're more burdensome than anything. That again, red flag, and you've got to remember how he com- or she communicates with you is likely how he or she then communicates with your delivery team. So if there's a concern or something during labor and delivery, what happens is the nurse or the midwife, maybe a resident, um, will call your doctor and they have a discussion about your labor and you know in and, and the different recommendations and whatnot. So if your doctor is really short or they're not getting all of the information, they might be making bad, you know, recommendations. And that's, in fact, what's happened, you know, in these cases. So good communication is absolutely huge. Um, If you do, I love my labor and delivery nurses. I love my doulas. If you do have access to a doula that delivers babies, you know, at the hospital where you're looking at, or, you know, a labor and delivery nurse or something like that, they always have the inside scoop on who are the good and bad doctors. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, they do. Um, Yeah, they can definitely tell you too how they, how they take care of their patients. There's always, there's always special nurses at most of the hospitals that they're like, yes, she will take care of you. You know, there's a lot of moms I see in my mom groups that are like, I need somebody who, you know, is trauma informed and can, you know, have great bedside manner and just understand that I just went through a loss and like all these things. And mm-hmm. 
yeah, it's going to take more than one seeing one doctor to figure out if it's um, if it's the right fit. And I think a lot of us like me in my beginning, you know, having babies, like I just went with whoever I was, you know, my insurance told me to go see like, you know, they write the PCP on the card and that's it. (laughs) That's yeah. no, or they give you a referral and they're like, here you go. This is the practice you're going to see, but that's not who you have to have that. You know, there's not just right. one person for you to see. And I, that's one thing I wish I knew going into just childbirth in general. Um, well, and that, let me say something about that. If your insurance is making that recommendation or they're like, Hey, go, um, go to this doctor first or whatever. So in that chapter, towards the end, I have a list of 20 questions that basically in every single case, I ask a doctor to find out if it's, you know, help me figure out, is this a good doctor or a bad doctor? And we ask these questions because I need to know, you know, is this a doctor I can stick in front of a jury? Juries don't like bad doctors. Listen, juries are just made up of, you know, they're a jury of our peers. They're me, right. you, they're, you know, everybody across the board. So these are not, you know, convoluted hard questions. These are almost like just some common sense questions that you really need to, you know, talk to your doctor about to find out more about them. And I'll use these questions to either um, bolster a, an expert or a doctor's credibility or discredit a doctor. For instance, one of the very first questions is uh, doctors who deliver babies are OB, obstetrics, GYNs, gynecology. Those are two separate fields of medicine. Obstetrics is your pregnancy. GYN are your women, you know, your chick issues. GYN is more nine to five. So especially as doctors get older, they like the GYN because when you're doing obstetrics, you know, those are hard schedules. Those are nights. Those are weekends and whatnot. But you want to, when you're talking to your doctor, you want to find out what percentage of your practice is obstetrics, delivering babies, and what percentage is GYN, gynecology. And you want a doctor Um, who the majority of the time, they're delivering babies. They're going to have, they're going to be in the trenches every day. They're going to be at the hospital a lot. They're going to have an idea of who is on your delivery team, they're going to have a better, hopefully it's a good doctor, they have a good relationship with them. They're going to know who on the delivery team they can trust, who they can't trust and, you know, and whatnot. So it, it's important that, you know, you ask and find that out. So like for a jury trial, if I have a doctor who is commenting on a labor and delivery, but he just delivers two babies a year or three babies a year, I'm going to pull that if I want to discredit them, I'm going to be like, that's great that you want to talk about this labor and delivery, but let me get this straight. You only deliver two to three babies a year. Isn't that correct? Yes. Okay. Good luck in front of a jury doctor. Yeah. You know, awesome. if you're going to come in a labor and delivery, but same thing, you know, just pushing over now to yours, you know, you want the doctors who's in the trenches, who's used to being called in to come, you know, basically doctors are called to come in and catch the baby. Right. They may come in to check on you. They may come in to check on you. Um, But, you know, you want to find out, okay, so if you're at home, doctor, how far are you away from the hospital? You know, and do you have rush hour where you are? Yeah, because if you do, that uh, it can delay (laughs) your doctor getting there. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of different questions that are, you know, important that we use in these cases that really yeah. every parent should be using as they figure out if this is a good doctor that they want, you know, heading their delivery team. And remember, your delivery team is responsible for bringing your baby safely into this world. In the legal baby cases, it is their care that is at issue and analyzed more than any other aspect of the case. So having that good doctor to head that team is huge. Yeah. I see. I didn't even the distinction of the OBGYN because it's always just in one acronym. Mm -hmm. Like there's, see, that's, that's why what you're doing is so important because yes, you are, you know, you work with the hospitals and the, the delivery team and all that, but you are using everything that you've learned to help the moms. (laughs) <laughs> the dad's on this side because you've so, seen the worst of things. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Most people assume that I have been the attorney for the families all of these years. And Guilty. No, 
<laughs> that's initially I what know. I thought too. That, that's a very common thing. But the fact that I'm actually, I have been the attorney and I'm still a partner in my law firm. I'm still doing the baby cases. I have a baby case sitting right here, right now next to me. But however, me being on that side of the case is what really helps the parents because I, you know, there's a lot of closed door discussions Obviously, I can't repeat those closed door discussions in the book, but they're in my head. And based upon those discussions, I can tell you what you need to know and understand to make sure, again, these mistakes and complications don't happen. But, you know, if you're the attorney for the family and you're trying to write a book like this, you don't, you know, their their access to, so if it's an attorney, they represent the families in these cases. They only have access to the healthcare providers through a deposition, which is, you know, and this is an adversarial proceeding and it's a cross examination where, you know, I can have some candid discussions, you know, with my clients and, you know, figure out what's up, what's really, you know, happening and going on. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, what you've created though, it's like, it's not just a book, it's a tool. I mean, from what you have, you know, I think a lot of us are just so uneducated. Like we go in the childbirth, like, oh, let's have a baby. You know, we want to have a family and do all these things. But this isn't what we're given, right? We're given like, here's what you're going to experience. Here's the symptoms that you're going to have when you're pregnant. You know, here's Mm -hmm. your baby's going to be the size of a banana. (laughs) This is what needs to be talked about. Yeah. Um, I'm like, I mean, like I said, I'm not even halfway through the book and I'm already like, oh my God, if I would have known, if I would have understood, like, I can question my doctor, I can question like my, my team that's going to be there. Like, this is my body. I don't have to, you know, I, I wish I could have stuck up for myself when, you know, with Evelyn, because It's not Mm. only did they take my choice away, they made me sit in labor for 10 more hours and coming in and out, like, because I asked to be drugged. I'm like, I'm not going through this, you know, and luckily it was like shift change. So there's another reason he probably didn't want to do a C-section. The, the nurse or sorry, the midwife that came in, her name was Gretchen and she, she made everything better. She's like, I will give you anything you need, whatever you want. You know, obviously within, yeah. you know, um, but she made it better since, ever, right. you know, the midwife and the OB weren't there anymore. Um, but where was I? Going to yeah, it's just Your story um, is so upsetting. And that's why I mean, that's that's chapter one. And listen, this is not this is information that you can take with you. You know, when I talk about the good doctor, you know, I've had a lot of people comment and say, okay, this is information I will use with every doctor. Even chapter one, when I'm like, listen, you medically are the decision maker. No one's doing anything to you without your consent. And you make those choices. You know, I went to the dentist last week and they wanted to do a mouthful of x-rays, right? I'm like, you're going to take two x-rays and then you're going to evaluate my mouth, look at the x-rays and tell me if I need more x-rays. I don't want a mouthful of x-rays. They were like, what? No, this is what we do. I'm like, yeah, you're not today. And (laughs) you you have to like, but, but you know what I mean? That's, but I know this stuff in my head. So it's easy. Like you can take this information and you can use it across the board with anything because no one can do anything. That's your body, your right. No. So if you want two x-rays, you know, I will say the third one was an extra 95 bucks. And I'm like, I was being cheap. And I'm like, no. Yeah. So, but you know what? They did their two x-rays. So he looked in my mouth, they evaluated the x-rays. And then they were like, um, okay, well, we, st-. so the doctor came in, had a discussion with me and explained why I needed that third x-ray. Then I made the decision based upon what he said to, yes, have that third x-ray. So was it a little bit of a headache for him? Probably. But you know what? That's that's the power you have. If you want to go in that day and, yeah, you well, know, maybe they didn't need to take that third x-ray. And I could have saved 95 bucks. Who knows? But that's the thing. No matter what it is in life, you are the decision maker. Just keep that in mind. And once you make that decision, it is my decision. Go chart it in the medical records. If you don't like it, get me ready for my C-section or whatever you're saying to them. Yeah. You know, there's another thing. 
my um, the chapter, so I can't wait till you get to chapter seven. That's the baby advocate one, but it starts with a very powerful story. Actually, after this podcast, you should go read it because okay. you'll appreciate it. And, um, but basically my cousin had, um, who's like a sister to me, like we're in each other's weddings and all that fun stuff. But, um, she had to be back with her first baby. And so for her second baby, so be back vagin. wait, I'm sorry. Her first baby was a C-section. Jeez, old Pete. How can you be back to your first baby? <laughs> Just be a, be a, be a, stop me if I say something stupid. <laughs> her first baby was a cheese. Okay. First baby, she did try vaginal birth. It ended in a C-section. Second baby, her doctor wants her to do a V-back, which is a vaginal birth after C-section. My cousin's like, I just want an elective C-section. You know, she's older. She's 40. You know, at this point, you know, it really hadn't been that big of a gap between babies. You know, whatever. Doctor is, she's out of Tampa in Florida. And doctor's like, you know what? I'm not going to schedule you for an elective C-section. We do those on a case-by-case basis. She's like, but vaginal delivery is a completely safe option for you. You know, the so so just so your audience understands, and I'm sure most of them know, but so the issue with the VBAC, vaginal birth after C-section, is when they go in, you know, to deliver your baby in a C-section, they make an incision in your uterus Mm -hmm. and the concern with the doing a vaginal birth after that is that c-set is that incision from the c-section will then come open and that can be very life-threatening for both mom and baby but anyway my cousin also understanding the so that's called a uterine rupture if that happens if that old incision breaks open it's called a uterine uh rupture and there, you know, with the VBAC, there is a low incidence of uterine rupture. However, it's very important to understand that if it does happen, it can be life threatening to both you and baby. And yeah. because it's your uterus that's inside you, nobody can assess how that incision healed. Very important. Anyway, moving forward, she's like, I want my C section. The doctor is like, no. And we're not going to schedule you for one. So 35 weeks. So my cousin had called me during this time. And I'm like, you can have a C-section or get a new doctor or whatever. But she went in early. Her water broke at 35 weeks. She's starting to contract. And she's at the hospital. And again, this doctor is like, no, why would we do a C-section? Your water broke. You're contracting. We're going to jumpstart you with a little bit of Pitocin. Why don't you just do, you know, the vaginal birth? My cousin calls me. My cousin's still like, I want my C-section. And they're just literally not giving it to her. She calls me. I had to go through the discussion we just talked about earlier, you know, in this podcast. You're the decision maker and whatnot. Plus, I don't like uterine rupture. I've had uterine rupture cases. They scare me. It is what it is. So I just told her, listen, if it was me, um, I would, you know, unequivocally we use my big word, unequivocal, unequivocally, I would do a C-section, but her instinct was on the side of a C-section. This wasn't, you know, so we just had this discussion. She went back, literally had to demand her C-section. She has a C-section, baby's delivered healthy. After the C-section, the doctor came up to her and told her something we will never, ever forget. When she opened the abdomen then to deliver the baby during the C-section, The uterus where the old incision was, was paper thin, and the baby's hair was poking out of the incision. Mm -hmm. The doctor said, if you would have listened to me and you would have had done a vaginal birth, you would have had the uterine rupture. That means that her baby may not have survived or she may not have survived. Because both, it cuts off oxygen to the baby. You have eight to nine minutes to deliver a baby after that happens. And not to mention mom. I mean, that's a whole mess for mom too. It's a very scary situation. And the doctor ended it with, thank you for not listening to me. And I really hope to this day that doctor has changed her practice. Right. Because let me tell you, you know, so, but that's a story in the book. You know, that's, that's gonna, you know, it it not only explains what uterine rupture is, you know, VBAC, but then also standing your ground. And listen, I'll tell your audience a secret. You can literally go onto my website, scroll down on the homepage. It'll say email Gina Monday. It goes to my phone. 
if something happens and you're sitting on labor and delivery and they're not listening to you, put your phone number in. I will literally call you. So I don't, it doesn't matter. I'm here to, you know, help families and, you know, make sure that, you know, they have a healthy baby and avoid complications that people are listening to them. Because I will tell you the hardest part of my job by far, and I've always struggled with it as a mom, a wife, a human, is when I have to sit down with the families and talk about the day their baby was born or the day they lost their wife, the day they lost their baby. It's always been very difficult. So, you know, it's part of my decision to, instead of getting involved in the aftermath of something going wrong, trying to get involved before childbirth in any way I can to help parents. Amazing. I'm so glad. Like, I think, too, that's another like she might not have known consciously why she wanted to have that C-section other, you know, but intuitively something was telling her that that's what needed to happen. Mm -hmm. And so for her to stick to it, you know, and not be swayed and have you by her side, right? (laughs) That's fine. I'm telling you, you're going to be in trouble. Well, actually, you know what? Actually, Valen, you know what? This is in the book. So what happened is, you know, I had I called her. I'm like, I got to include your story in the book. So we go through the story. We go through the conversations, you know, just okay, yeah. I got this all right or whatever. But then I we ended, you know, talking about it. And then I asked her real quick. And I'm like, wait a minute. If you didn't have me to call, would you have tried a vaginal birth? And she said, yes. Yeah. So it's important. It's This is such important information that follow your instinct. Stand your ground. Have you know, an advocate. Yes, be an advocate. Call an addict. Call me. You know, run it by me. I'll I'll tell you. I don't care. So I don't. I just really, obviously, just want more healthy, healthy babies. Yeah. Oh, well, before we end here, I mean, is there any? If you could give one piece of advice for bringing a healthy happy baby and having a safe birth, what would it be? What would your biggest piece of advice be? 100% learn about childbirth. Read my book. Chapter one, those are the lessons. Again, we're going to learn from these lessons and to prevent it from happening in the future. If you understand things like chapter 11, chapter 11 are the common issues, common facts. You're going to have a heightened sense of awareness. You know, this this information will help activate your intuition so you can make those, you know, incredibly important decisions. Again, and I know I've already said this, if you're going to have a Pitocin induction or if you're pregnant, actually, if you're pregnant, just read chapter 14. Chapter 14 is how to have a safe Pitocin induction because it's a very individualized drug. And nobody knows how your body is going to respond. It's very important that it's a very slow and steady, you know, if possible. Obviously, there might be medical reasons, you know, not to go slow and steady. But slow and steady type of Pitocin induction is going to be way, you know, way better for baby 100%. But it's important that you read that chapter and understand why. And last thing, the fetal monitor, the baby's heart rate. Listen, I've had doctors testify. I've included it in the book. They'll say, Gina, the only way a baby can talk to me during labor is their heart rate. That means if you can understand their heart rate, you can understand how your baby is doing during labor and delivery. So again, that's chapter nine. I go through with you. This is what you need to know about your baby's heart rate. And then if there's any concerns or there's any decisions, you know, you talked about the interventions. You had a bunch of interventions done when the baby's heart rate dropped. That's because it doesn't go, so square one is the baby's heart rate. Everything always starts with the baby's heart rate. Okay, it's dropping or there's some concerns. They don't go from concern with the baby's heart rate to C-section. No, it's a process. Yeah. And in that process are the interventions you talked about earlier in the podcast. And those are the ones that they were doing on you, probably flipping you on your side, probably doing IV bolus, maybe some oxygen, depending on what year it was. Um. Or whatnot, they're going to do things to try to get baby's heart rate to come back. And if it doesn't, then maybe make, you know, a plan B with you. Um, But understanding those tests and interventions are so incredibly important. It's going to help streamline the communication so you can 
you know, inter- talk to your team and understand what they're saying. The the important stuff's not going to be swallowed up by the small stuff. Yeah. So, but I'm telling you, you know, the medical community, I feel like really wants to keep the baby's heart rate to themselves. And I am like, no, as a parent, an expecting parent, an expecting grandparent, yeah. whoever, if you have a friend, you're going to labor and delivery because your best friend's having a baby and you're going to be there. Learn how to read the baby's heart rate. Yeah. You could literally help save the baby's life if it comes to it. So. It's just important, very important that, um, again, parents have a, a good understanding of some definite, some aspects of childbirth. The chapter you probably read real quick, chapter two. So, you know, first lesson, learn about childbirth chapter. Cool. So each lesson is a subsequent chapter. So then chapter two, probably the things you were reading going, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So chapter two is everything yeah. that's that I find important as a childbirth attorney that will help you that will help give you the foundation of knowledge to make those good choices. So I call them basically like my labor and delivery basics. But when I look, I get a new case in and I'm like, is this good care or bad care? These are the facts about childbirth that I rely on to make that determination. So that's why I included in the book. So if you guys have this knowledge base, it'll then, you know, help you make those good decisions. That's amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your experience and doing this for everybody. Like we will get this in the hands of everybody if possible. Um, Uh, Thank you, Valen. It's amazing. I appreciate you so much. Um, You're definitely making a difference in what you do. And I think we're probably going to have to have a part two if you want so we can talk about those other things. I know we didn't really get to the fetal monitoring and the Pitocin, but thank you so So much. much. You're very welcome. And just so you know, I was thinking part two in my head, and then you said part two. Good. So, <laughs> that, so we're both on the same uh, wavelength there, and we're both on the same page. So we'll definitely have a uh, part definitely. two. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. It was so good to see you. Uh, same. Thank you so much for listening to the Pregnancy Loss Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I created a guide on 20 ways to celebrate your angel baby. It gives you 20 amazing ways to celebrate their birthdays or ways to just remember them on any given day. If you want to download it, head over to valenweb.com slash resources and click the link. I hope you guys have a great week. See you next time.